Um, I came here when I was about six years old and came with all of my family. <laughs> um, we just came straight here to Crete, Nebraska. Um, this is where I grew up. I started first grade and finished high school here. So. They think it's, you know, we choose to leave our family, our homes, and everything to come here. But in reality, it's, it's a big sacrifice, and if we didn't have to, we wouldn't. So I came here when I was six years old to the United States, mostly because my parents knew that in the United States, I would achieve greater heights um, in my education. And because at the time, Juarez was the most dangerous city in the world. I didn't want to come to the United States. I was really upset at my dad, and I told him I don't want to go. And because I was, I had already started school, and my friends were everything to me, and my grandparents. I'm really interested in the in DACA and in the welfare of the Dreamers because of, uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I really believe in the United States and the Statue of Liberty and, and saying that, you know, give me your poor, your tired, your hungry, and, and come to us and we will, we will try to help you. I didn't find out I was undocumented until I was in middle school. It was a big shock because I just, I felt normal, like, I felt like everybody around me. Uh, my parents wanted me to have as normal, I guess, quote unquote, whatever that means, a lifestyle as possible. So they never told me until it was time for um, applying for schools. And then I asked them like, hey, they're asking me for my social security number so I can, uh, and I was like, I've never heard of that number. That's so weird, mom, how come? <laughs> I think maybe we've all had that at one point, maybe not, I don't know. But I was like, that's so weird. I've never heard of, what's a social security number? And my parents were like, <laughs> like, instead of having, like, the talk, this was the talk for us. <laughs> I remember my mom would always, she never actually told me, like, hey, you were undocumented. She said, just don't mention it. Say that you're from Texas. And I was like, okay, like, that's where I'm from. After a while, when I started noticing, like, my, fam my friends wanted to save up money for their car when they were 15, 16. I'm like, oh, I want a car. I'm going to start working when I'm 16. And then I was like, oh, I want to do the same thing. But then my mom was like, no, you can't. No, you can't. Um, she would make up excuses. She'd be like, oh, I, it's because I want you to finish school. And so after a while, I was like, mom, I'm serious. I, I want a job. I want to work. And she's like, I'm sorry. Like, you can't. And I was like, what do you mean I can't? She's like, you don't have papers here. And I was like, well, that's easy. I'll just like look online, you know, how to get papers. But it wasn't really easy. I was like, oh, it's asking me for this. Like, what is it? She's like, you don't have that. And I'm like, well, why don't I? She's like, well, because you weren't born here. I'm like, well, I'm from Texas. Like, do you need something from Texas? She's like, no. She's like, you're, you were born in Mexico. Um, I'm sure your parents, when they had you, even though you're an American citizen, they're like, I want him to be better than me. And that's what my parents brought me here. Um, you know, they always told me when I was growing up, because I knew from a young age that I didn't have papers. Because I, I was pretty much raised in York, Nebraska, a very white town. Um, I'd say the population's average from seven to 8,000 from the time I was there. And when we moved there, it was probably my family and I'd probably say three to five other Latino families or even minorities, Asian families. I never felt like an outsider. The community was always very open. They accepted me like right off the bat, you know, because I came there and I started kindergarten. Then my parents were more involved. Uh, they brought Mexican food, they brought like sopes, enchiladas, tacos, whatever, to like different school events, and they loved it. I saw snow, I made friends, I learned English, and everything was basically normal, you know? I played with friends, I went to school, I learned, and it's at certain stages of your life where you're reminded that you're undocumented. So, you know, you get to age 16, and then you can't apply for your driver's license. You can't even get a permit. And then that's the time where you start thinking of working. And then you're like, well, how am I going to do this? I'm a child of immigrants, um, but I'm also 
the universities, I would argue, lead, lead um, activists on behalf of DACA students, been responsible for helping to create a scholarship program for, for Dreamers here on campus. And um, we now have 50 Dreamers on full academic scholarships here at the university. So my, my number one priority is to make sure that they are secure and that they can continue their, their programs of study to completion. We don't ask students for social security numbers unless uh, they need uh, federal financial aid student loans. And these students can't apply for student loans, so we don't need a social security number for them. A lot of scholarships required U.S. citizenship, and I asked my parents like what my information was, and that's when they broke it to me. And I feel like when I first started college, it hadn't hit me yet, just because I don't think that my life had been any different. I had gone to school, I had participated in orchestra and track, just like anyone else. But College of St. Mary actually has a scholarship that's spe specifically for students who are undocumented, who can't qualify for federal aid. Omaha Public Schools offers the career ladder program, which takes paras to become teachers. So I applied for it, I got into it, and so, um, through Concordia University, I will be getting my bachelor's degree in elementary education with an endorsement in special ed in May of 2018. I am a special education paraprofessional, so I feel like they teach me more than I teach them most days. I work with kids with autism. I work with kids who have a learning disability, an intellectual disability, who are ADHD. And every day, they teach me about patience, about love, and about the joy of learning. Currently, I'm 22 years old and I'm working as a digital analyst. And I'm also working on personal projects, such as writing. Um, and I plan to go back to grad school soon. I graduated in 2010 with a paralegal bachelor's degree. And at the time, I didn't have a social again. So then, you know, it's like, okay, what do I do now? Um, so I started my own company, and I started um, a translations company. So then I started um, translating documents, for, uh, legal documents, and um, documents for other uh, law firms. My advice for these students, the students that we have here, the 34 of them, I meet with them routinely, and I say, stay in school. That's my advice. Stay in school, stay the course, get your degree. No one can ever take your education away from you, do you know? And it will pay you dividends later. Regardless of my future or, I guess, whatever the government said or did, I was gonna be successful. Like, there was no one that was gonna take away my education from me. That I always, you know, whenever I do feel that situation, we're like, oh man, you know, like, this sucks or the situation sucks, it's like, no, it's like, I have this, what I feel like phenomenal education, uh, you know, all these gifts that I feel have been awarded to me that I've worked for that no one can take from me. So the DACA program was created um, through an executive memorandum uh, issued by the Secretary of Homeland Security. It laid out um, uh, the sort of youth that, that, that would be able to qualify for the program. And these were young people who were brought to the country at a, at a young age. They must have entered before um, the age of 15, 15 or younger, and who had lived in the United States for a certain period of time that was five years prior to the announcement of the DACA program, who were either in school or graduated from school, had no serious criminal convictions, didn't present as a public safety threat. So this was sort of the base, at the basic level, this was the announcement of the parameters of the DACA program. A person had to then apply, pay a hefty fee, um, undergo a security check, uh, background checks, and then after that they were uh, granted deferred action and issued a uh, work authorization document. So the practice of granting deferred action is not a new practice. Um, it's existed in regulation since 1981. It's existed as a practice of immigration authorities since the 1970s or before. So for more than four decades, this has been a practice that's been used. It's been cited by Congress multiple times in specific statutes, immigration statutes, recognizing that immigration authorities have the ability to use and exercise deferred action as a law enforcement tool 
and it's even been cited by the Supreme Court as a tool within the immigration authorities' toolbox uh, to enforce immigration law. Here's the process. You send everything in. Hopefully everything's good. Your money, the $495 or whatever, every two years. Uh, then you're going to go get your biometrics taken. I think that was the point where my mom was like the most scared because she's like, where are you going? I was like, immigration. And she's like, uh, she's like, why? I was like, well, I was, I, was like, I was like, I don't have a choice, mom. The instructions are very clear here and they tell you what day. They don't, they don't let you choose. They tell oh, you yeah, what day and you. what time. Uh, nearly 800,000 people um, have participated in the program. Um, they're currently uh, living here in the United States. They're working in the United States or going to school here in the U.S. Um, these are individuals that um, have jobs. 91% of them uh, are, are in the workforce, uh, and they're contributing to their communities. That um, is a huge economic driver for local communities across uh, the country and across uh, our states. Uh, and it... Um, has huge economic benefits to, to what we're doing uh, on a local level. So when DACA passed, it was very liberating. It was like breaking the chains and chains that I'd built for myself because of what society had made me feel. Um, like I was a criminal, like I was a leech of the system, um, like I was a parasite and unwanted. So. I constructed this, um, these bars for myself that really kept me down. So when DACA passed, I was able to kind of break from that, mm -hmm. um, break from what society was telling me I should be and owning who I wanted to be. I remember the day, it was like a sweaty summer afternoon. I had like come home from playing basketball at my elementary school, my old elementary school. I was like 17 at the time. I'd got home, I was like out of breath, exhausted, walking home, you know, and I, crawled, I, I went up the stairs and opened my door. And then my dad like was on his couch and usually he's on his couch, he's on the couch, and he just lays there and he says like, hey, like he barely looks at you and he'll look back at the TV or something, right? If the TV's on. But instead he had like got up and came to me and was like, he, I could see like his eyes were a little watery and I was like, what's going on, you know? And he was like, he said, you know, it's here. You know, we, we waited for this long and we didn't know, we, all we could do was hope, you know, we were in darkness for so long, but somehow like this light came, somehow something has saved us and something came out of the woodwork and someone like is like rescuing us. And then I was like, what are you talking about? He said, and then he just started explaining like they passed this law and like it's gonna let you get a driver's license, it's gonna let you get a social security number, it's gonna let us take you to school. Well, pragmatically, it allowed um, me to work. You know, that was something that being from a um, lower socioeconomic background um, was instrumental to helping my family. So being able to work and work at a job where I could actually use my talent and my skills, um, that was really important to me. Um, in Nebraska, we weren't able to drive right away, even though DACA um, recipients around the country could. So fighting for DACA rights and driver's licenses in the states, um, joining other nonprofits, joining other dreamers and DACA recipients was really, again, me being a part of the democratic process, even though I'm not a citizen, um, I still have rights and I really wanted to embrace um, that part of who I was. And um, now it's being able to identify myself with an ID, um, getting prescription medication, which is something that most people don't think about. Um, it means opening up a bank account. If I want to go out with friends, you know, I'm, I'm 27. It means going out with friends with an ID that people won't look at twice. Well, the most important thing for me is going to college. So it finally provided me like a path to go to college and find a good career. Like in 2016, when they announced that we would finally be getting professional licenses, I cried because that was a big deal. And I think that's the biggest accomplishment for us. Nebraska is remarkable for two reasons. We passed legislation to finally give all our DACA students driver's license. We were the last state in the country to do that. But we were the second state in the country the following year to pass legislation to provide all of them with professional licenses. 126 different categories, I think, of professional licenses. That was a signal that the state legislature, which is ostensibly nonpartisan, sent to the public that we want our DACA students to stay here. We want them to have opportunities to become hairdressers, plumbers, nurses, doctors, attorneys, accountants, engineers, so on and so forth. 
When I came out of the shadows and I began to get involved with local nonprofit agencies, I began to see the power behind the legislature. And in Nebraska, we have a unicameral, so that really makes it a unique process to be able to testify. Um, I testified three times in the past three or four years for DACA recipients. So being a part of that and seeing the legal aspect behind it, um, studying immigration law and knowing how laws can and do dictate life um, has really impulsed me to become a lawyer. I knew I wanted to help kids in some way. You know, I think I had, I had a lot of people help me get to where I am. You were your first. And um, I, I feel like the best way to say thank you to them is to turn around and do the same. You know, I think I'm a big believer in that when you get to walk through that door that you don't just let it close behind you, that you leave it open and let other people, help other people get through. And so um, I didn't know I wanted to be a school counselor. I didn't even know what a school counselor did. I thought they just check your credits and then you, you know, all right, see ya. To many people in the society, immigrants are like criminals. They just came here to steal our jobs. But in reality, I think we came here to support our country because uh, not everyone's going to go out in the fields and pick up tomatoes, pick up different stuff, and um, or like spend their days. Like my dad, he would um, be until like midnight. Um, doing a good job with the floors. And so I don't think everyone's going to do the same jobs that us as immigrants or us, our parents do to help this country out. You know, my dad was pretty hard on us. Always worked. You know, he has a lot of scars from his work. Um, he works at a, at a place where they work with a lot of chemicals. They, they, they have to deep clean. And so it takes chemicals and, and a lot of hot water to uh, power wash basically a lot of stuff off and so um, the chemicals are um, if they get on your skin I mean they'll burn through your skin and so he's been burned quite a quite a bit so he has scars on his back and you know his hands don't close and when I talk to other students I feel like you know their dads some of their dads are the same that the way that my dad showed me love is that he was gonna make sure that I had whatever I needed Whatever he could provide, he was gonna, you know, work double or he was gonna try to make that work. He was gonna make sure we were on a roof over our head and, and food on the table. It feels good, you know, having a full-time job and even being able to take out your mom and dad and say, no, no, I'm gonna pay for it, you know? Sometimes they don't even, you know, go to sleep because they're making food or they're cleaning offices. And they're just so humble, it really inspires me. You know, I told them, I was like, hey, mom, like, it's going to be a sacrifice I have to make. I want to be able to provide for you in the future. Um, I want to be your 401k. I want to be your pension plan because that's what I am. You know, luckily, like I said, in accounting, in the business world, there's a potential to make decent money. And that's what I want to do. I want to be CEO, CFO of a company one day. Nothing's going to stop me because whether it's here in Mexico or anywhere, I'm going to do it because I know that my parents need me and my future family will need me. And I wanna be able to provide for them more than what I had, even though I was very blessed. Uh, there's been this narrative created where it's like dreamers had no choice. choice. Yeah. A blame game. Yeah, and I understand where it's coming from because yes, we didn't have a choice. So there's just empirical facts, right? That we didn't, uh, as minors, like we just had to go with our parents and that was the thing, right? It has been used against us in a way where it's like, oh, so it's your parents' fault, so we should deport your parents and just not you then. Or like we should split up with your family or something like that. Or it was your parents' fault and it just wasn't yours or sort of thing. I don't know, that's just something that it hurts me because I know that, you know, those are the people we're trying to serve. Every single one of us has talked about our parents so far and the contributions they've made to us and that the first thing that we serve is them. The vetting system instituted by the Obama uh, administration is very loose and lax. Uh, supposedly, the DACA recipients were supposed to have no more than three misdemeanors and no felonies. Uh, they filled out forms. There are no, no background checks on many of them. They slipped through the cracks. So the uh, DACA program, therefore, was awarded to some uh, illegal aliens who did have criminal backgrounds 
ranging from murder to identification theft, social security fraud, uh, and they're still residing in this country illegally. Do you, do you have any proof of that? Well, it depends on who you want to believe. We we take we check the statistics through what we consider credible organizations like Federation for American Immigration Reform, Center for Immigration Studies, etc. You know, some of us didn't make the choice to come here, or, and all of DACA recipients. You know, we were not old enough to make that choice, and we have been you know, raised in this country and we have learned. And obviously DACA recipients, they're not criminals. We go through background checks, extensive background checks to be able to get, you know, that work permit. And we are sometimes treated as criminals and discriminated. And sometimes people just don't know that we we had to, you know, find our own college funding to be able to go to school, you know, because we didn't have, you know, a loan. We didn't have a scholarship by the government to be able to do that. We had to find our own ways of having a career. I met my boyfriend and I was, we were, it was like two months in and I, Sometimes I forget that I'm even DACA because I feel so normal, like, I feel like I'm a citizen. So two months in, I realized I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm DACA, I should probably tell him before he like, cause that's something big. And I was like, well, I'm kind of like not from here. And he was like, what do you mean? You're not from here. I'm like, I'm a DACA student. And he was like, what's DACA? Like, I don't know what that is. Is that like a club at school or something? And I was like, no, like I came here when I was young. I'm undocumented. Like, I don't, I was like, yeah, some people don't want me to be in this country. And that was really hard for me. Like, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, I think, because it's just so hard telling somebody that doesn't have any knowledge on the issue. I had a representative, legislator that when I was sharing my story, um, I told them like, you know, this is and this, kind of like this, I work here. They stopped me and they're like, wait, do you pay taxes? Like literally that was what they said. And so I was just like baffled. I just kind of like, you know, just turned my head. And I was like, <laughs> like, are you serious, bro? Like, like you can't work in this country without paying taxes. Even if you are here undocumented and working illegally, you're still paying taxes somehow. You're contributing to Social Security, somebody's retirement. Uh, you're paying sales tax. These individuals were asked to come forward. Um, they were asked to follow a system, um, to tell the government where they lived, to give them their phone number, uh, to go through a thorough background check that included fingerprinting. They were vetted and deemed to uh, be uh, approved for this program. Um, and every two years, they've been asked to renew their deferral. Um, so they get a new updated work authorization. They go back in and get their information vetted again. They provide new updated information about where they're currently living. Uh, and so this program goes away. They're certainly fearful that that information will be used um, to, to remove them from this country or to remove their family from this country. When I talked to an immigration attorney, she had told me that at first when they came out with it, they'd said that they were not going to, um, they're not going to just um, basically distribute that information out willingly to people. Uh, they're not going to give that information out to other agencies. Well, they've since changed their language and says we're not going to proactively give that information to people. So to me, that means is well, we're not going to give it to them, but if they come ask for it, that's not being proactive. They came and asked us. My biggest fear is have I done something to benefit me that without knowing it's going to affect my family, that they're not just going to come after me, that now because I've done this, my parents are going to be rounded up too. Well, so there are about 3,400 DACA recipients in Nebraska today uh, who are contributing to the state. And if they were uh, kicked out of the workforce, uh, then the state would lose about $150 million annually in gross domestic product that's generated from their labor. Um, so these are young people, again, who are working. They are doctors, they are lawyers, they are teachers, uh, they are nurses. And for them to be removed from the workforce would only be a net negative for the state. 
So if you look at the 800,000 young people who have benefited from DACA, and you just focus on those who are in the workforce, uh, using the analysis that we've done with economists over the past year and a half, we would estimate that ending DACA and kicking those recipients out of the workforce would essentially suck about $460 billion out of the economy over a 10-year period. Again, DACA recipients also, because they're in the workforce, are paying the same state and local taxes, payroll taxes, that are pulled out of our paychecks every day as, as you or I. And so there's a huge contribution that's made uh, to state and local coffers as a result of that, um, and to the federal government as well in the form of their income taxes. I mean, importantly also, by paying it to payroll taxes, uh, they are actually contributing to the social safety net that they don't actually even have access to, right? So in terms of uh, keeping Social Security and Medicare con uh, solvent, those are funds that they are paying into through their taxes that they do not themselves actually have access to at the end of the day. Dreamers are contributing not only in picking, paying local taxes and um, you know frequenting local businesses, but 65% of uh, of DACA recipients have bought a, a car um, in the first five years of the program. 10% um, um, have bought a new home. 6% um, have started their own business. Many of them are employing U.S. citizens. So they're huge economic drivers within our community. In most places in the United States, unemployment is so low that we need the labor. So you look at most of the things that are being done, especially in the service economy in the United States, and they are being done by new immigrants. Um, and in many cases, uh, there are people who are either the parents of these dreamers, the grandparents of these dreamers, or the dreamers themselves. And so would we want all that labor to go away? I mean, who's gonna roof your house? Who's gonna mow your lawn? Who's gonna do, who's gonna clean your home? With America's birth rate, that the only way we can grow our economy is to continue to grow our workforce. And that's going to be mostly young people, and many of them young, new Americans. So these 800,000 Dreamer kids represent a significant increase to our economic growth rate, to our GDP. Huge outpouring of support from the business community. More than 800 business leaders signed on to a letter that encouraged Congress to pass protections for Dreamers uh, to make sure that these individuals were, were not uh, deported from this country. They talked specifically about the incredible economic benefits that uh, these individuals are already providing to our economy and that a broader uh, legislation like the DREAM Act would help uh, provide nearly a trillion dollars in economic growth to our country. That's huge. Uh, and that's going to have huge trickle-down effects um, across uh, our local communities. And when you think through sort of, you know, whether they're taking our jobs, from the macro level, economists have looked at that issue with respect to immigration and immigrants broadly and roundly reject the idea that, that, that American jobs are being taken in large numbers by immigrants. For the most part, immigrants provide a complement to the work that American workers are doing. They're not, they're not uh, uh, competing in many cases for those jobs. Over 20,000 teachers in the U.S. are DACA recipients. Um, so just on that basis alone, jobs. You know, we, a lot of DACA recipients are becoming educated beings. You know, we are going to graduate from high school. We're graduating college. We're even going on to, you know, a grad school. So um, we're professionals and we're a part of what happens in this country on an economic sense. We do it because it's a contract. It's a contract that, hey, you know, here I am. I'm coming out of the shadows. And we're showing that we're active members of society. Why would we turn this wealth of educated young people away when our uh, median age is creeping up as those of us who are United States citizens? Why wouldn't we want this renewal of youth in our country? Do you know? And it, do, it doesn't make any sense. Like I said, it doesn't make any sense business-wise. Why don't we want this labor coming in? And it certainly makes, at heart, it makes no sense in terms of who we are as human beings. And, and U.S. people, all of whom came from in, immigrants, all of us. You know, I don't know what people are like in Hong Kong. Um, I probably know because of my parents, maybe, but my parents are two people from Hong Kong. You know, I don't know anything about Hong Kong culture. I don't know anything about the music. I don't know anything about theater there. I don't know anything about, uh, I don't know anything about Hong Kong other than where it's at, how to spell it, and how to write it in Cantonese, you know? I'm an American. The only thing missing from that part is the citizen part. 
you know, my family is established here and they've lived here. My, my brothers and sisters, they don't know my grandparents. They don't know my aunts. They don't know my uncles. They were born here and they don't know anybody over there. And they can, their Spanish is so bad. <laughs> so uh, just having to uproot, uproot them is just, I don't know, something I can't comprehend. I think we all have our ideas of what it means to be American. For me, it's being who I am without being judged, without having hate and resentment coming my way just because the color of my skin, because of my status. Um, of course, there's privileges and immunities that come with being a legal U.S. citizen born in America, but there's also the ideology behind what it means to be American, and that's something that I embrace. I was going to an immigration information forum dressed in a suit and tie, and a woman came up to me and told me to go back to where I came from. Now, I'm born in Southern California, been public educated, public school educated. I'm a veteran. I, I, I've been selected and paid by the state of Nebraska to teach democracy. So I had to ask myself the question, what is it gonna take for me to be an American? What else do I have to do to be an American and have not somebody literally hit me over the head with a sign and tell me to go back to where I came from? Growing up here, um, having all your friends, your family here together, and I don't know anything other than this. <laughs> I just wish they could understand um, the fear we feel. And it almost seems unfair because I've done, I feel like I've done everything right. I've gone to school, I've gotten a job, I've paid my taxes, um, I've, you know, helped others. And it's almost like a slap in the face to not be able to call myself an American. Specifically, since I studied business, what I want to do as an American is to help other, um, maybe uneducated folks who couldn't have that education be aware of business opportunities they have so that they can grow in jobs, so that they can grow in net worth. Yeah, so ever since Kindergarten, I guess I've like just been embedded with the American dream. I like never really thought I had these limitations. Like I would go, we had career day, which is awesome. Where we're like every year I dress up with something different. Like I want to be a rock star someday, mom. Like, no, I'm kidding. I want to be a hairstylist. And I'm like, no, I want to be an actress and win an Oscar. So like I always had these crazy dreams. My mom would just laugh, be like, oh, Liz, like you're so creative. Like. And like I didn't want to pick a fence. I didn't want a two-story house or a dog or a like or a wife or kids like three, two and a half kids. I didn't want any of that. I just wanted to live my American dream, which was to be free, to be liberated of of earthly chains that are like you can't do X, Y, and Z because you don't have a paper. It's just so interesting that that differing in American dream is like, you know, for some people it's like success and like a six-figure salary and financial freedom. Whereas for us, it's like, I want to be able to walk down the street and not be scared. I want to be able to, you know, go to an institution and not be discriminated against and sort of thing. So that idea just like really hit me. As much as I want to convey my humanity, my compassion, the fact that I'm a human being and not a legal, Mm. contradicts with what is actually happening in the legal narrative, mm. which is something that people constantly are debating. You know, should they be citizens? Should they be granted a pathway to citizenship at some point? Should they be deported, you know? Mm. And for me, being a dreamer, dreamer has really changed. I used to, <laughs> when I was growing up, um, six, seven years old and realizing, beginning to realize um, what was happening, I always hoped and dreamed that someone would come and be my savior. And as I've gotten older and as I've gotten wiser, I realized that I don't have to wait for anyone. I can be the person to fight for myself and to begin to fight for others. You have these, these good dreams or these kind of like um, great thoughts or these great um, hopes for what the future is gonna hold. And that's what we're, that's what I, um, we're all kind of, dreaming for is something that's permanent, um, not this temporary thing, which which has been a blessing. I mean, it's I wouldn't be here if it was, in this position if it wasn't for DACA, but it's not a fix. It's not like being a dreamer just instantly affords me this otherworldly strength that I conjure from some like weird, you know, force. There's nothing <laughs> like that. You know, being a dreamer is also, 
being weak, you know, being hurt, being, being part of this group that has no agency, being part of this group that uh, often our voices aren't heard or devalued. My dream is that we're just looked at as human beings. And I like envision like me and my mom being in like this little green garden area and then just like butterflies roaming around and that would like calm me down and like make me go to sleep. And so literally that's how I felt. Like I just like pictured the butterfly and like me flying. Being able to finally be free and not ashamed because I've like never truly felt like I belonged here. Like the land that I was raised in, like it always sort of like judged me. You know, as a political science major, I've been able to study the history of the United States and what's happening now has happened against other groups and they've overcome adversity, they've overcome these struggles and they came out, granted, you know, it, it happened through a lot of pain and suffering, but they came out the other end. I think I've been preparing for this fight my entire life mm -hmm. <laughs> in bits and pieces, you know, and I've met the people that I've met for a reason. Um, and I don't think I'd, I'd be the person I am today if I didn't have a purpose. The whole point of America is the, the salad bowl slash melting pot of all of us that we add to it together as a nation of different voices and ethnicities and, and colors and perspectives. We are the immigrants. We are the immigrants. The mighty, mighty immigrants. The mighty, mighty immigrants. Fighting for justice. Fighting for justice. And the Dream Act. And the Dream Act. It is time to pass the Dream Act. Woo! And pass it now. Yeah! Yeah! Well, what it means. What it means is not only an opportunity for hundreds of thousands to be part of America's future, it is an opportunity for the rest of us to reaffirm who we are as Americans, what we believe in, what our values are, what justice really means to us. This is a simple matter of justice, that young people who were brought here undocumented will be willing to be given the opportunity to be part of our future. You know, one of our missions at United We Dream is to make sure that immigrant young people in this country um, can feel empowered by their stories and come to D.C., uh, make their voices heard, speak to members of Congress, and be shaping um, the narrative of immigrant young people in this country, but then also be shaping policy. We're calling to uh, this evening to talk about the future of Nebraska's immigrant youth, uh, also known as Dreamers. There's definitely a political solution uh, that lawmakers, regardless of political party, um, can come to, to to ensure that DACA youth uh, are not being deported and removed from the United States. My position is that we need to find a permanent solution for DACA youth so they never have to worry about being deported for law-abiding DACA. But we have to also do it with improvements at our border security and fix our visa system. So we need to do both. These are youths that arrived in our country as children, no fault of their own, um, and they provide a real value to our community. Many of them only know Nebraska or Omaha as their home, whether it be in education, um, employment, service, they really provide an important value to our community. I do also support a pathway to legal status. I believe children of undocumented workers that came into our country as minors should be given the tools that they need to become productive citizens. The day that the president uh, canceled that, uh, my mom and I were actually making tamales because we saw tamales and we were sad for a little bit, but instead of getting depressed about it, we just prayed and kept on making more tamales because that's what defines us, just being hardworking and hoping that someone will notice and someone will see that we have a lot to offer to this country.